Welcome to Quilting's First Reality Show. Yes. Unscripted and live with Susan Smith. Yes. Hi there, and welcome to the Stitched by Susan channel. I am Susan Smith, and I'm so happy you're here quilting with me today. We call these live and unscripted episodes because this is airing in real time, whether or not you're watching it live or on a replay, but it is real time quilting and real life quilting. So I'm going to be working on a whole project, hopefully from the very beginning to the very, very end today. It's a very sweet sampler quilt um, with Lori Holt blocks from the Farm Girl Vintage book. So it's a really, really charming quilt. And I'll be talking through the process as I go. So this is not a class or a lesson per se. This is just me working on a client quilt and kind of thinking out loud so that you get to listen in on the conversation and look over my shoulder as I'm quilting. So that's kind of my goal with these episodes. And honestly, my goal as a quilter and a teacher and encourager is that in showing you these things, in showing you what goes on in my studio, that it will encourage you, it will... Um, help to take away maybe some of the decision paralysis, paralysis that you find yourself in and just give you more confidence in your quilting. So if you enjoy this style of video, please click that like and subscribe button. There's even time if you still want to share this with a friend that you think might enjoy it as well. So yes, today's project will be an entire quilt from beginning to end. I'm gonna focus quite a bit um, because it is a smaller quilt and the quilting itself won't take all that long. I'm going to really focus on the loading and basting um, and some of the things that surround that. So if those topics are of interest to you right now, you really want to stick around for the whole thing. So before we get going, a few credits that I want to give and a few other places that you can find me. Credit-wise, um, the Yoda voice at the beginning was our son, Will. He's recorded a few of these introductory, introductory videos for me, and they're all in different voices, which just make me smile and chuckle each time, right? So thanks to Will for doing that. Also, a huge thanks to my husband, who I call Mr. Producer throughout the show. He is the brains behind this whole operation. It is definitely not a one-woman show, so I sure appreciate him on his day off um, coming in and doing these live and unscripted episodes with me. And also our good friend Dan Unger, who is the guitar player in the music that you're going to hear gently in the background through the whole episode. So thank you to Dan for allowing us to use that music. I get so many compliments on it and I'm sorry to say it's not available to purchase commercially. You just have to come and watch the show. So these live and unscripted episodes I try to do twice a month. And again, they're not a lesson. They're just an overview of me working usually on a client quilt, sometimes on my own. But it's not chosen for the fabric or the thread that particularly shows the quilting. It's intended to give you that big picture view of the process as a whole. So you're going to see the whole quilting machine. You're going to be able to see the loading. You're going to be able to see how I move around the quilt top, those sorts of things. So it's that big picture look for you. So if you don't see the details of the quilting design, it's because that's not as much the focus today as that big picture. So also you can find me on a podcast, which someone mentioned a little earlier when we were all chatting hello before the show began. Um, it is called Measure Twice, Cut Once, and Other Life Lessons Learned from Quilters. And most of those episodes are interviews with other crafters, often quilters, and just chatting about what quilting has meant in their life or possibly their business um, and just what the creative process looks like for each of these individuals. So it's all about stories, crafters and their stories. So you can find that easily at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. If you are interested in supporting this show, YouTube, as you know, is a free resource for all of you. But if you're interested in supporting the show, you can do that easily by going to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan for the price of as little as one coffee, five bucks. Um, you can make one contribution there or you can, if you wish, sign up to contribute monthly. All of the money that we receive there goes into equipment for producing these shows. So cameras, lighting, cords, cables, routers, etc. All those things. So to all of those of you who have generously supported, a huge thank you. You are truly what makes this possible. And we try to keep growing and improving as time goes on. In that theme of producing better quality videos, let me tell you about a little thing that I just, well, I want to say started yesterday because the first item went public yesterday, but I started it weeks back. Um, Mr. Producer is so helpful in doing all this live work that I do, but I also want, I have so many other things that I want to talk about and share. And so I realized that I've got to learn at least the basics of producing some video content that I can release on YouTube. So it's pre-recorded. 
and then release to you. So yesterday, the first one went live. If you want to watch it, it's only a three minute video and it's the number one lesson I learned from a hand quilter, which of course was my mom. And it's something that I use every day in my machine quilting, actually. So see what you think of that. That's my first endeavor into creating those videos. And again, I know that with practice, I will just keep leveling up and keep leveling up and learning as I go. So there's that. But yesterday was day number one. So again, if you enjoy this kind of free and easy unstructured style and the real time that shows every little bit of the quilting, great chance to like and subscribe. So the thumbs up, that really helps us get more visible and more people to see these episodes. So we appreciate that. Okay. Have I covered the things today? Um, Jan is asking, Susan, is that quilt behind you an edge to edge or what is it? Stunning and fabulous stitching. Yes, it is. And it is freehand. It is not a digital design and I call it crazy eights. And I do have, I'll take a moment to mention this, but I won't dwell on it too long. I do have a freehand quilting masterclass, which is an online comprehensive course. What did I say wrong? Freehand quilting masterclass. I think I said it. I don't know what I said. He's, he's reminding me it's not free, but you guys know what freehand means, right? Of course you do. Anyway, it's a comprehensive, um, class that does drill down into the specific designs. I quilt them all on black fabric with white thread and talk you through over 30 designs. And this is one of them. I call this Crazy Eights. Um, I just had a great review from a student actually this last week who kind of said, I've seen Susan quilting this. I've seen it on her quilts and I never in a million years thought I'd be doing this design and have that kind of control. But here I am. And she showed a picture of Crazy Eights on one of her quilts. And it was so great to see that and see that light click. And kind of that's what these episodes are geared toward as well. Just getting you over that fear of wrecking a quilt and just helping you work through those decisions and grow whatever skills you need to grow and get out there and make beautiful quilts. So long answer to your short question, Jan. Yeah, it's a freehand quilt. Crazy Eights. Okay. Any other questions or we're going to dive in? User says I have a cable loop behind my head, which is probably not attractive. There we go. Let's get that down in there and we're going to get started. So I'm going to take one more sip of coffee and grab the backing for the quilt and we're going to start loading. <clears throat> so one more thing I'll add, we're going to try and, um, we're going to try and answer as many questions as we can throughout the episode. Um, but it helps us to, if you will type the letter Q, like literally a capital Q before your question, because then we can search all the comments and find those questions. So if you would do that, when you have a burning question, we'll be able to come back and find it. Let me just make adjustments here. Okay. So this is the backing for the quilt. They are Lori Holt fabrics as well. And we're going to get a different camera on so you can kind of see this big picture view. Give us one second. Here we go. So it's mostly this kind of picnic reminiscent red and white gingham. It wasn't quite large enough. So the quilt maker, her name is Joanne. She put in this strip of green. And this is one of the considerations as I'm loading this. Well, there's several to do with the backing, but this strip is right in the middle, top to bottom of this backing piece. And I want it to be in the middle on my finished quilt. I don't want it to be off by just a little bit. Like you certainly could choose to have this stripe very offset, but you don't want it to look like you were trying for the middle and just missed it, right? So since she has pieced it in the middle, I want to quilt it in the middle. And the way I do that, I'm centering it from top to bottom on my frame. And so I laid it out on the floor beforehand, centering my quilt over this stripe. Okay. And then I measured where my quilt needs to come to on this backing and I put a pin in it. So I'm going to load the whole backing, but when I go to lay the quilt on it, that's going to be the top of my quilt so that it lines up with this stripe and keeps that centered in the middle. Okay. So that's one consideration. Another one is if I have the choice, I always go with putting the seams that are in the backing horizontally. It works more easily on the frames as you're loading. If you have a vertical seam, you can end up with some tightness in that seam and it's harder to get flat. 
not impossible, but more difficult. So if I have my druthers, I load the seam going vertical. That works with this quilt in mind, but I also need to be aware it is directional. And so actually my quilt is going to be going um, crossways on my machine as well. The top is going to be here and the bottom is here and the sides will be top and bottom frame of my long arm. So I'll try and talk about those appropriately um, as I'm quilting so that you can see it. And for my own um, just keeping track of things, I tend to always load top to the left. Some quilts, and this is one of them, are in fact directional and some backings are directional. You need to get that right, right? And so I just have kind of um, cultivated the habit of always doing my top to the left. So when my backing is loaded and I come to my top and it says top on it, it's got a label, I always know that's to the left and I don't have to crawl under my frame and look, right? So that's just one little tiny shortcut that I take. Now in terms of loading, those of you who have been here before will know that I love to use the red snapper system. And I've had to make some amendments on my long arm machine. Um, let me get my head all in the picture. I don't want to make this story too involved. But this current machine has a dead bar on this side. So the quilt runs under that dead bar and onto the take up roller. And so the space between that dead bar and my long arm is something that I had to open up in order to run these snappers through. And I was having difficulty with my tension. So I've closed up that gap and my, um, my hybrid currently, this may change again in the future, but my hybrid currently is that I'm using the red snapper on this front side and I'm going to pin on that side. So if you're a pinner, this will be great for you. You'll get to see that process as well. But I do love the red snappers for their speed. So they've just got, there's this little plastic rod inside this hem and these long snappers clip to it. It's the fastest way ever to load a quilt. And this is another side benefit of loading this backing in the direction that I've chosen is I've got a selvage edge here. So I know that it's perfectly straight. You do need a straight edge for the front in order to load in my kind of time-saving method. So we know this one is straight because of the selvage. On it goes. Doesn't matter that there's excess. Now I'm going to take a minute before I load the other side and I'm going to wrap my leader all the way around. You guys can't see the dead bar. It's running right along under here under this rail and I'm going to wrap my leader right around and you'll see as I load the backing how that works to orient it in the correct way for my take up bar to pick up the quilt later on. The quilt has got to feed under that um, dead bar. Sometimes called a leveler bar too, but most commonly called a dead bar. I suppose because it doesn't move or change or serve any other purpose than to hold things flat. So the important point with this quick loading method is to have the quilt going straight and smooth over that rail and make sure there's no moving off to the side. Can you see how when I move it even three quarters of an inch, I start to get these angled pulls. I need to make very sure that it's going straight over to the other side. This alone enables me not to have to center. I don't have to find the center of my leader or of my backing or of my quilt. I just load this front straight edge of my quilt and I'm going to allow the tension of rolling it on to pull it on straight. So I just need to arrange it straight and then keep an eye out as I'm rolling it. And we're good to go. So I'm just watching underneath as the edge of my backing approaches the edge of the leader. And once it's there, I will come around to the other side and attach with pins the far edge of my leader. Now, if I had any wrinkles or creases going on here, I would have been smoothing them out as I rolled, but it rolled on quite smoothly and nice, so we're good to go there. So this will take just a few minutes for me to pin. Once again, if you have any questions throughout the show, please type them in with a cue. 
I will take the time to answer questions um, kind of between passes of quilting and I will do my very best to get to all of them. So while I pin, because I know this is a bit like watching paint dry, um, if you're just tuning in, we call this a live and unscripted episode because I am airing it in real time and there is no editing. So what you see is what actually goes on in the process of quilting in my studio. I do not make any claims for this to be the way to quilt. This is just the way that I do it. So even in terms of loading, there are many quilters and many methods for loading a quilt back and a quilt top. I do not teach the one right way. I just show you the way that I do it. I do quilt for clients. Um, I've done about 1,200 quilts, all of them freehand. And, well, let's word that differently. I've done over 1,200 that are freehand. I have done others that are digital. Um, but in the course of that, uh, it was important to me to learn to be efficient with my time. For a long period of time, that was um, kind of the bread and butter in our family, and it was important that I was efficient um, with my time and used it wisely. And so this was the fastest way that I found to load quilts was with the red snappers. And it does not take very many minutes. And the idea that you don't have to take the time to center all the individual components is a massive time saver. So now that that is pinned, I'm getting my steps in, trotting around the long arm. Now I will just proceed to roll it into place. And just like that, we have a loaded back. Beautifully straight, beautifully flat. I'm happy as glam. Okay, let's talk batting. Mr. Producer says, sorry for the shaky camera. He was adjusting things. So, okay, remember I said earlier, I've put a pin on this side where I want the top of my quilt to line up, right? So that is in order to... Um, um, orient my quilt so that it's centered over the stripe of contrasting fabric that's in the backing. So that's important. The batting I'm using today is actually 100% wool. This quilt is for an adult, so wool batting is still machine washable but needs to not be done in hot water or a hot dryer, so it needs just that little bit of care. Not the best choice for a toddler quilt that's going to be washed and washed and washed, but a great fluffy, lightweight, warm, comfortable batting for an adult quilt. One thing I am going to do, I'll move it to this end so you can see it. My batting is just a little longer than my backing. And because I want to be able to clamp to the edges of the backing, I'm going to take just a moment to fold this up and just trim that batting off a little bit. This will get very much in my way if that's left there. Bear with me while I get a pair of scissors and we will trim that off. I just want it to be a little narrower than my backing. Like so. Okay, apparently we have lots of questions. Let's have a look at those. Sharon, when does your next next master class start? Great question. Um, enrollment will be opening again. I'm planning for November. Generally, I try and run it twice a year. And the reason I say run it is because I get a group of students all in there at the same time, and they kind of progress through it together. So it never expires. You have it forever. But during that period of time, I do live Q&A sessions and things like that, that um, you know, I'm just more involved for that period of time. So I like to take a group of students through it. From there on, you know, they have access to it forever and they can rewatch as often as they like and there's no deadline. Phyllis, cue for the quilt that's hanging behind you. Oh, got it. Question. Is there a pattern that can be purchased or acquired? There absolutely is, Phyllis. Um, it's on my Etsy website and it is Stitched by Susan 2015. So if you go there and I... I'm trying to think where there's a link for that. That's something I need to add. Okay, Mr. Producer is going to try and put it in the comments for you, but the shop is called Stitch by Susan 2015. 
The pattern is called Starstruck. And it's the featured pattern there right now, so you'll see it right at the top of my Etsy shop. Super easy to find. And it was released at one time as a block of the month, so it's it's like a booklet. It's a involved pattern. There's links to tutorials and all kinds of stuff that comes with it. Diane, if I get stuck, if I get a tuck in my backing, it always seems to end up on my right side. Any tips on how to avoid? I use wide backings. I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the end of that. I use wide backings and pieced. It does it on both, always only on the right. It gets baggy. It makes me wonder if your leaders are not level anymore, are not straight, if they have um, distorted or stretched. Because that sounds like it's not feeding onto your take-up bar evenly. So I would look into that. I would do some measuring and see if those leaders have gotten stretched out of shape. It does happen over time. Uh, Sue Tap, would you be able to remove the dead bar so you could use the red snappers? No. Because these my, two, my front and back rails are at different heights. So the quilt goes flat under that dead bar and then onto the take up. So no, you can't remove it. I do know others who are using the red snapper successfully with this machine. So I may try again, but I'm trying to just eliminate variables as I'm learning my new machine. Nancy, has this fix helped with your thread breaking too? Great question, Nancy. And maybe now's as good a time as any to talk just a wee bit because my last couple of live and unscripted episodes in March and April and May, um, have been fraught with thread breaks at my Bernina Q24. And so a few things that I've done, well, a lot of things that I've done and tried, but a few things that have produced uh, measurable results. And one of them is I did take my machine in for professional servicing. And one of the things he found was that the needle bar was ever so slightly off center. And so adjusting that is the single thing that has made the largest difference. And of course, a number of people have said to me, well, gosh, your machine is brand new. I just got it in January. How come you've got to get it serviced already? Well, for one thing, I do quite a lot of quilts on it. So several million stitches were done in that period of time. But also, I was thinking about this the other day and thinking, you know, when you get new tires put on a car, they send you off to drive for a little bit. The bolts kind of settle in. They do whatever they do mechanically, which I don't really know. And you always have to go back and get them retorqued and realigned. So I wonder if possibly my long arm machine is like that. My service guy did say to me, he will often see Bernina machines come in, you know, after a few million stitches, they come in, they get a full servicing and just a little tweaking, and then they run for miles. So, you know, fingers crossed, that's what my machine is going to do too. It kind of makes sense to my non-mechanical mind that those first couple of million stitches are just kind of breaking everything in is settling into the rhythm and all those things I don't know but it did really seem to help so thanks for your interest it seems like we've gotten the problem solved and certainly I've been turning out quilts again lately and it's great it's great Sandy Susan have you ever tried the zipper leader system so I do have the zipper leader system Sandy I just don't use it very often because I don't take quilts on and off very often in progress so there's kind of two reasons you would use the zippers. If you're taking one quilt off to work on another quilt, right, then you could easily zip one on and one off. And another would be to load your backing onto that zippered portion and then just zip it onto your quilt frame. And you absolutely can do that. That's a fine way to load a quilt, but you do have to place it specifically then. You have to know where that backing's got to be on the leader on this end and where it's got to be on the leader on that end, right? So then it involves centering. So for me and for my skill set, this is still the fastest way. Load the straight edge on the front and roll it on. Ah, okay. So Mr. Producer is trying to clarify. Apparently there are a number of questions and, and, and you're kind of leaning toward if I use the zippered leader, could I still use the red snapper system? Where the snappers are giving me trouble is when I load the top edge of my quilt and then I want to go under that dead bar and my long arm is there, it's got to fit through. So there are a couple of things you can do. One is certainly to have enough um, leader on my backing at the top that the red snapper is already on that side of the dead bar. That's probably the easiest solution. A lot of my quilts come with not that much um, excess fabric on the backing, right? And so I can't count on that. And the thing with the, with the red snapper is I've either got to have 
that leader in the hem and use it all the time or not. I can't just flip flop back and forth. So for now, I've chosen to pin at that end. Um, yeah, I keep exploring, honestly. Mandy, when pinning leaders, how far apart do you leave your pins? Do you use straight or safety pins? I use straight pins, Mandy. They're corsage pins, so they're, they're uh, very sturdy. And I kind of put them nose to tail, a little bit longer than that. And I, and I take like an inch long stitch with them. So, Paula, so you take the leader off your front bar and roll backing on the bar underneath. Oh, okay, Paula. Yes, I see what you're asking. And yes to that question. And you'll see why as we get a little further on in the quilt. I have magnetic bars that I want to use here. So I like to have only one layer of fabric going over this belly bar. And my backing is loaded to the rail that is below that. And that's my own modification. Mr. Producer's telling me, get going. I'm taking too long. Okay. Why didn't you use snapper on the take-up bar, Margie? Okay, so you, you saw that in the last conversation. Sharon, why did you not use the red snappers for loading the top of the back? Okay, so if you weren't here for the loading process, I, I was talking, yeah, maybe hit rewind, right. It has to do with the red snappers fitting between my dead bar and my long arm rail on the new machine. Roberta, I also have a Q24 and use red snappers on the front, but sew tight magnets for the take up rail. Works great and faster than pins, but the sew tights are expensive though. Yep, I have found that too, and I have not tried them out for myself, but I did see the expense. Thanks for chiming in. Okay, you guys, one or two more, and then we gotta get quilting. Pam, the bars on my frame are aluminum, so I can't use the magnets. I purchased the red snapper system, and now my bar clamps won't work. Any suggestions about securing my quilt? I'm not an expert on that, Pam, because I've always had rails on which the magnets do work. So I would look for, you know, Facebook groups or something like that, people that have your brand and type of machine and see what some of their solutions have been. Good. Oh, more. Michelle, when you're centering the top on the backing vertically and mark with a pin for the top edge, do you find that after quilting it shrinks up enough to end up off center a bit from the backing? Michelle, that does happen, but it is so minuscule that the eye won't see it. Like it might be a quarter or three eighths of an inch, right? But it's still going to read centered on the quilt. It's when it's two or three inches off that it reads uncentered. I've had good success doing it this way. Dawn, so you typically trim your batting to be approximately an inch narrower on each side than your backing. Yes, and sometimes it's, there's more difference than that. It's even narrower, but I don't let it hang over the edge. It gets caught in the rails. It gets caught in my clamps. That's a nuisance, my opinion. Terry, Susan, I don't know if this has been asked, but what was your prior career? You're an absolute fantastic teacher. Ha! I homeschooled my kids for a bajillion years, and we had four children. So there was, you know, try it this way, explain it that way, approach it another angle. That was my, that was my prior career. <laughs> Savannah, I have an Avante with a studio frame. The snappers fit under the bar on mine, but I'm currently trying to Velcro to attach my backing. Interesting. So how do you attach the Velcro to the backing itself? I'm interested in hearing that. Okay. One more question, Jen. There are clamps made of plastic that you can use rather than magnets. Yes, and, and, and the lady who asked that was referring to clamps, but different brands even have different sizes of bars and different clamps. There's so many variables there, and I don't know the answer for you. So let's get quilting, though. I think that's enough questions for now, yeah? Okay, let's get quilting. We've lined up the, the uh, wool batting. It is extended a little bit above my pin so that I can put my quilts on there, and it won't run over the edge. And because I knew I would be talking, and sometimes that distracts me, I put a pin in my top left corner so I wouldn't get it wrong. But I will visually do another check. You can see that my little quilt is directional. We've got a pumpkin here. There's cherries down here. There's a teapot and a chicken somewhere, right? There's a top end to this quilt. One other thing I wanted, well, there's several things, but one thing I'm going to talk about now on this quilt is my friend Luann sewed it. And I, and I diagnosed what happened, and then she confirmed it by telling me the story. Part of it she pieced some time ago, and part of it she just recently finished. And what can happen when you do that is, you know, your seam allowances are just a tiny touch different. And that is visible in this quilt, just a little bit. So when I had it laying flat on the floor, I could see one half of the quilt was just a little bit tighter, a little bit smaller than the other half of the quilt. Knowing that helps me to address it as I'm quilting and 
when it's all said and done, nobody will know that. That's the mark of, um, that's the beauty of, um, I'm losing my words here. It's cumulative, right? So if I were to just start at the top and quilt, quilt, quilt to the bottom, I would end up with this side. This is the slightly larger side hanging longer at the bottom. But because I already know and have planned for it, every time I advance, I'm going to be lining up my seam lines of my sashing. And it's going to involve a little zhuzhing, my favorite word, a little zhuzhing of this end of the quilt to make it a little bit smaller to match this end. The finished result will be perfectly square. It's like magic. So I'm going to go ahead and pin this in place. And I'm going to go ahead and drop a few pins in this time. When you are basting a quilt edge, it's also important to look for, you know, is there any ruffling that needs to be taken in? And there is a tiny bit on this one. There's, you can see this narrow sashing all the way around. It's, well, there's sashing between all the rows, but it, it comprises the outside border as well. So I'm going to go ahead and take the time to drop in a couple pins and they're going to be kind of my check and balance. So when I'm basting across this edge, I'll know by the time I get to that pin, I've got to have pulled this in, right? That prevents me from running along and getting a big old pleat or awkwardness like that. So I'm going to just start doing it and do less talking. <laughs> and we've got to get quilting. So if I drop a pin in the middle and this edge, I've got visually straight. I may adjust it a little as I go, but these couple pins are just going to be my kind of anchors. And I'll sort of do the top of the quilt in fourths. I think that will be enough. If you're not as comfortable winging it as I am, you know, maybe you want to drop in more pins. That is certainly an option. So I'm going to use this basting process to square up the outer edge of the quilt. And then I'll use my quilting to pull any irregularities in that I need to. I'm going to go ahead and roll this up a little bit just because I do have all that excess at the top and I can do a wider swath than that. Yep, you can still see the basting. Good deal. That's what we want. So I've got my machine loaded with, um, pardon me while I release the channel locks. I've got my machine loaded with eggshell colored Isocord brand. 100% polyester thread. It's my favorite thread at this point. It's a 40 weight. My favorite thing about it is the fact that it's 100% poly and therefore very low lint. Okay, you guys, I was in the studio early this morning and I actually turned my machine off. And it's so funny, in all this introduction and talking, I haven't noticed that. So do we have any questions, Dave, while it warms up? I will move Stella off to the side. Sorry about that, you guys. Jen, Susan, could you spray with water the top to see if it relaxes? Um, do you know I could, Jan, and I probably, honestly, I probably could starch the end that is a little larger and pull it in. It's not very much, right? And so I'm pretty comfortable just doing that at the quilting machine. It's my favorite way to do it. I don't just love spraying water and starch onto other people's quilts. That's just my opinion. Um, it's it's literally less than an inch. Like this end is, there's only about three quarters of an inch difference from this end. So that's going to be perfectly easy to take in with just quilting. So that's how I choose to do it. But absolutely, you could do it other ways. Okay, Stella's awake. One moment while I turn the bright lights off so you guys can see. There we go. Gail, so you baste your quilt top on with pins rather than stitching. No, I am basting it with stitching, Gail. I simply laid those pins in for reference points. You'll see as I baste across the top how I use them. And I frequently have my channel locks on when I'm basting. I'm going to change this to quarter inch instead of half. I'm working on a pretty small quilt today, so I'll be 100% honest with you. I'm squaring this up by eye. You may not be comfortable doing that. 
I've done hundreds of quilts and it is speedy and I am comfortable doing it. So it's the way I choose. I am going to put, no, I'm going to leave it just like that. Okay. As I baste across the top, watch how my fingers work. My goal is going to be, there's this little bit of fullness. My goal is going to be to pull it under the needle just a little faster than it would go on its own. Okay. So I'm stitching to the right and I'm grasping the fabric that's already been stitched and putting just a bit of tension on it. That little bit of tension pulls it under the hopper foot just a little bit faster. If I did not do that, you would see fabric pushing out in front of my hopper foot and eventually a pleat forming. Can you see that there beyond my finger? That's what we want to avoid. So all my pins are, to Gail who was asking, is anchors for me to see how much fullness I need to pull in. So by the time I get to that pin, I've got to have pulled in any fullness. I just dropped a pin about every quarter of the way across the top of my quilt. No, I guess every eighth. I divided it in half first and then quarters. That would be eight. So can you see just that my little bit of pulling on what's already been stitched, we're going right over that pin. We're going slow enough. That little bit of pulling just eases in that tiny bit of excess. And I want to underline too, these are not, there's not crazy amounts of excess. I'm not dealing with a poorly pieced quilt by any means. This is just, fabric has a little bit of give, a little bit of pliability, and this is how I manage it all the way through a quilt. And I do this from start to finish of the quilting process. And by putting in that little extra effort to manage it, you never end up with the horrible glaring problems of pleats. And sometimes it's enough, you can see my left hand here, this is the nose of my long arm right here. Sometimes it's enough just to press a little bit on there and that pulls the fabric under the needle. So there's all these ways that you can kind of manage the fabric. I'm using a quarter inch basting stitch today. You could use a half an inch. I like a little oftener stitches. Sometimes I baste with the same stitch length that I'm quilting with because I just don't take the time to change it. I don't think there's a wrong way. My basting stitch is well within um, the quarter inch seam allowance, so it's all going to fall inside the binding and no one's going to see it. It's just for my convenience and for keeping the quilt square. This is all it's about. So I'm doing the same thing from behind now, putting a little tension on this fabric that's already been stitched to pull it under the needle just a little faster. And you can see there's a bit of fullness that's going to come up here. I see that happening. I don't want this seam to be sagging downwards. I want to keep it up and keep it straight. And even though those are basting stitches, I'm going to anchor them so they don't come undone, so that quilt does not shift. Okay, our top edge is basted. Let's talk for just a jiffy about quilting design because that was a factor in thinking of this quilt too. And while I talk about it, I'll put my front clamps on. So I've mentioned them already. They are, to me, critical to keeping this whole surface stable and unmoving. So I've already watched that my seam line is straight. I don't want it to pull up as I'm busy putting a quilting design on here. I want it to stay flat. So when I put these magnets on, all four sides of my work surface are then secured and held in place. Okay, quilting design. We are doing an edge to edge design and I talked with Joanne about it and we batted around a few different ideas one of them was, you know, something floral. Many of you have seen my hibiscus design. That was a thought. But we felt like the hibiscus in particular was a little bit like laying another story on top of the already very interesting story of Lori Holt's blocks and all of their charm. So we decided instead that we would be wiser to go with a quilting design that's um, uh, less pictorial, if you will, and more just texture. So I'm going to be quilting filaments today. This design is one of my own as well. 
um, and it came straight from a paper napkin. It's really fun, but it does lay down much like the Crazy Eights behind me. It just lays down this evenness of texture and you almost don't notice the quilting design. You just see the texture. But one of the things that's great about it too is it's very curvy. And so it's excellent at taking up any excesses that you need to. As I said, this, this is not severe at all. There's just a little bit of excess in this end as opposed to this end that I want to pull in. So a curvy design will do that sort of magically. Do we have any big questions before we get started quilting? <clears throat> I'm going to get a sip of coffee while we ask, wet my whistle. Trish, I notify my clients that centering the seam on the back creates a weak spot over the years as the quilt is folded repeatedly. Do you not find that to be a concern? So the, the seam is not actually centered, the stripe is centered. I do agree with you on that. I don't think that centering a seam perfectly is a great idea because of it getting folded there all the time. But in this case, it's a stripe that is centered. Cheryl, do you baste across the top and down both sides? Yes, now I do it in one fell swoop. I go up the left, across the top, down the right. Personal choice. Joelle, I have a five foot hoop frame so I can't baste the entire top edge at once. Should I still baste whenever I shift the quilt? I'm wondering, Joelle, if it wouldn't be wiser for you to baste the thing before you start quilting, like maybe every 12 inches in lines. I think you wanna stabilize the whole thing if it's shifting around, but I'm no expert on a five foot hoop. So again, question you might want to ask someone who uses a similar machine. Lauren, sorry if this has been asked, is this a different batting than you usually use? It looks puffier than other quilts I've watched you do. It is a little bit different. This, is, this one is 100% wool, um, which I absolutely love the feel of, but usually I reserve for adult quilts because it needs to be washed at a lower temperature and dried at a lower temperature. Not a good choice for a toddler quilt, but a very comfy batting. Deborah, what are your end bars called? Do you mean the grippers at the end? They are, um, it's by the Red Snapper brand, the same people. Uh, the shop is called Quilts on the Corner. Same people make them. Uh, there should be a link. At any rate, after we finish this episode, I'll have a link for my favorite tools and the Red Snapper products are in there, but that's who they're by. And really any clip that you can find that has the long grip, that's what you're looking for. Elsie, what thread is in the bobbin? Exactly the same thread as in the top. So the Isocord 40 weight in an eggshell color, 100% poly thread. Okay. Let's get started quilting. So I'm going to start with my stitch regulator on. I kind of always do because that just helps me to um, kind of get in the groove of the pattern again. And then I will turn it off because it's got little red lights that shine where it's on. And I know it's not the prettiest thing to watch. I'm just, by the way, pulling out my fancy yardsticks. These were my grandfather's. And all they're doing is hoisting my clamps up a little bit. My quilt is not a lot narrower than the uh, backing on both ends. And so I'm afraid I would run into and bump those clamps. So by lifting them just a little bit, I have more freedom of movement. And I can feel that when I slide back and forth under them. I don't, I don't sort of clip the ends of them. And I'm stitching at a um, 10 stitches per inch is my current length. Grab that thread and pull it out. There we go.
We're going to go into manual mode. Let's just take a minute to set up the speed here. I'm going to start at 1300. We'll go from there. Maybe needing to adjust it. So manual mode, if you're not familiar with it, just means that when I push start, the needle starts moving at a fixed speed. You can hear that the sound is very even. So it's entirely up to me to determine the stitch length now by how fast I move the machine. So I kind of gauge this Oh, and make adjustments as I go. Uh, I'm going to stay on regulated while I'm talking. When I'm on manual, I make adjustments as I go, and we have a broken thread. Seriously? You guys? I'm starting to think it's the cameras. Before the days of my thread breakage epidemic, I used to say, when it happens once, I just fix it and go on. When it happens a couple times, then I start looking for a deeper problem. So, so far we're at once, and we'll see what we see. So what I'm doing now, you saw me re-thread my needle. My bobbin thread is still intact. So I've just taken one stitch, pulled up that bobbin thread, and now I'm going to undo a few stitches to a good point where I can make that join unobtrusive. And I tell you what, guys, send your good vibes, and if your prayers, send your prayers that this is not going to be a chronic thing again today. Seriously, I have quilted and quilted and quilted this week with happy results. And I did not want this to happen on air again. So again, I'm just undoing to a point of my stitching just because that makes an unobtrusive place to put in a few lock stitches and begin again. That's all I was doing there. And I think we'll stay with the stitch regulator on for the moment just to keep the variables down. My pause there was just me deciding where do I want to go next? Do I want to fill in that awkward corner? And I decided to leave it. It's just going to be a, a narrower pass. Did you see me quilting on eggshells? I'm quilting so slowly and carefully now. I'm so nervous about the thread breaking. Come on, Stella, you got this. So I'd love to hear your feedback on our design choice. Do you agree that this curvy, curly, um, fairly evenly spaced design is a good choice for um, just adding texture to the quilt without adding sort of a contrasting something that the viewer is looking at? So the viewer almost won't notice the quilting, which is fine. They'll be so busy looking at all the beautiful Lori Holt fabrics and all her charming locks. Like I said, there's a chicken, there's a teapot, there's all kinds of things. I'm just looking back at where I've where I've been and how much um, how deeply I need to go toward my front rail. No shame in pausing to look ahead and make those decisions before you get yourself quilted into a corner.
few of these seam allowances are quite bulky in the center of the stars. So I just slow down a little bit over them and I also actually make an effort to stitch over them or very near to them. That helps to make the quilt lay down flat when it's finished. The temptation is to avoid those thick seam allowances and not quilt over them because they're difficult. But what happens if you quilt a half an inch away from them is that you end up with these um, kind of buttons of seam allowance that stick up in the finished quilt. You don't want that. So right here, for example, I'm purposely quilting very near to that thick seam allowance. That will help it to lay down beautifully flat when the quilt is finished. And right there I didn't feel like I had enough room for a whole other motif. So you can see I just echoed my way back out. That echo, because it's similar spacing to the size of these little loop-de-loops, will just disappear right into the quilting as a whole. An echo is a great tool for getting yourself out of a corner. I don't think that I have ever made an entire Lori Holt fabric quilt, but I'm seeing a few in here that I recognize and it makes me realize I am drawn to her fabrics. Both the yellow and the green in that little block or two that I know are in my stash. Too fun.
out a bobbin thread, which I knew would happen soon. I did not have a brand new bobbin in when we began. If you watch me regularly, you'll know this is my method. I don't monitor the bobbin um, thread, but I do just quilt until it runs out. And then I put a fresh bobbin in. Let me move my hand so you can hopefully see a little better. And all I'm doing now is undoing the last couple of inches because there was no tension on the bobbin thread and so it's kind of awkwardly formed stitches. So that may not strike you as the most efficient way for dealing with bobbins, but it's my way of choice. Um, my machine does have a bobbin monitor on it, but it still relies on counting the number of stitches and all kinds of factors, and I can't be that precise on it, and I don't like wasting a ton of thread, and so I just choose to do it this way. And what I do too when I'm fixing to put my new bobbin in is I drop my blue seam ripper right where my join is going to be so that I can find my way when I come back. So let's just move off to the side. I'm just going to lift my yardstick out to get in under there and put my new bobbin in. So one good thing has come out of this uh, thread breakage issue that I've had, and that is that I am much more regularly checking the tension on my bobbin. Have you got an overhead camera, Dave, to see? So I have the handy little gauge. I do. Where did I set it? Okay, that's funny. Right here. Which view are we on, hon? This one? You can see me there? Let me move Stella a little bit. So I'm just using, um, if you've got the Toa gauge, this is the Bernina branded one, but it works the same way. You set your bobbin in the casing, in the gauge, you put it flat on a surface and run around the little pulley system and you've got a little dial that gives you an exact tension on the bobbin and also tells you, and that's what I love about this gauge, it also tells you if it's feeding smoothly. So if that dial is going wong, 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 wong at all, that's not a good sign. Pull out a couple yards and try it again. But mine seems to be feeding smoothly. It's at a great tension. My recommended tension is 2 to 220. Mine's just on the high side of 2, so that seems perfect. And reach in underneath with that bobbin casing. Kind of working blind here. Back to where a seam ripper marks the spot. I'm sorry if my hand gets in the way there. I'm trying to get used to our new position for this close-up camera. So again, I pulled up the bobbin thread and I've done five stitches in quick succession there. Not in the same hole, but in less than an eighth of an inch. And that's how I anchor those stitches and then I'm just going to keep on quilting from there. Pause a moment and clip those thread tails. So as we get near the end of this pass, this is a great opportunity again if you have any questions about the loading process that I've talked about or indeed about this quilting process, it's a great time to type them in. At the end of the pass, I'll stop and take some questions. <clears throat> also, I'd love if you'd give this episode a thumbs up if you find that you're enjoying it or that it's helpful. Give a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you click on the bell, you will also be notified whenever I have new episodes up. If you are just tuning in, we call these episodes Live and Unscripted. I'm pausing to put my yardstick back in. We call them Live and Unscripted because we are airing this quilting in real time. There is no editing. So you get to see the process exactly as it happens in real time in my studio. And that can be really, really helpful. If you're newer to quilting, and some of the decisions that I've been talking about 
with regard to, you know, maybe the seam allowance direction on the backing or how to deal with a quilt that isn't precisely flat or how to choose a design. All these are common, common questions. And hopefully just talking me through the decisions that I've made is helpful. You can see here that I'm seeing the results of some of this buildup of fullness. And so I'm just using my left hand to uh, manipulate the fabric just a little bit. And much like I did with that basting, I'm just encouraging it to get under the needle and not to push out in front of it. If you're not comfortable quilting with one hand, sometimes this can be accomplished by putting small weights. This is the nose of my long arm right here and having something slightly weighted on both sides like water bottles or vegetable cans can also help with that same process of keeping the fabric going smoothly under the needle. Then you get, you know, that tiny little bit of fullness eased in as opposed to pleats. So think of it like easing when you're sewing a, a seam on your quilt. It's easing for the quilting process. And here we are at the edge. So I'm gonna go ahead and break thread just so that you can see what I'm doing. Most often, I would go ahead and leave my needle down and my thread in and advance the quilt without ever undoing that. But just for the purposes of visibility, I'm gonna go ahead and move Stella out of the way. So I'm basically rewinding all the things I did to anchor my quilt, taking all the magnets off, taking the yard sticks out, taking the side clamps off, getting everything ready to baste. And when I get that all undone, I'll take a moment for a sip of coffee and to take your questions and chat. Okay, Stella's out of the way. You guys get a nice view of the bright light there, don't you? Okay. All right. And just so you know, I'm standing well away from the quilt. Betsy, if you cannot use the bar magnets on the belly bar, how else can you stabilize the front edge? Most quilting machine brands, especially those who do not have magnetic bars, have some type of clamp. And I've seen quilters find things at hardware stores that are amazing that they've sliced open an edge and used as a clamp. So again, recommend finding Facebook groups or, or asking in your quilt guild for people that use the same brand of machine that you do and see what some of their tips are. Vera, do you ever have fabric bleed when you spritz with water? I have never had that happen on a quilt, Vera, but it's kind of why I would be hesitant to, 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 uh, generously spritz a quilt top with water while it's in my care and it belongs to someone else. I haven't had it happen. Fingers crossed. Heidi, do you miss your gamel? Oh gosh. <laughs> Basically, no. Both machines have their own strengths and even a little bit of weaknesses. The Bernina quilts like an absolute dream. So I love that. I love the feel of it and the quiet smoothness of it. So, no, and, and by the way, my gamble still lives here. It's in another room, so it's hard to miss. It's not very far gone yet. Savannah, thread breakages and such are why I find the unscripted and lives helpful. Seeing how others deal with things that come up, things always come up, helps me become more confident when similar things come up when I'm quilting. And that is my hope, Savannah, and certainly I've been very open. I mean, several of these episodes had a lot of those thread breaks, and I talked through a lot of the considerations a lot of you had tips and ideas, the hive mind at work. Nadine, I watched a few episodes with lots of thread breakage. Did you figure out what that problem was? Is Bernina known for that problem? N no, definitely not. Um, and I talked about it earlier in the episode, so you might want to rewind to that. I did have my machine fully serviced and some things did come to light. Um, one that I didn't mention then is my service guy recommended using a little bit larger needle than I had been using. I was erring on the fine side 
you know, in the interest of keeping small holes in the quilt, et cetera, but I was going too fine. And he said that can quickly start to cause thread breakage when, you're, when your needle eye is just a little too fine. So he recommended a bigger needle, so I am doing that as well. So all these things work together, right? Gwenna, what pattern are you putting in the quilt? I call it filaments. It's my own design. Came straight off a paper napkin. I call it filaments. So yeah, I'll come back to that one in a minute too. Susan, what mode are you in? I am in BSR2, which on the Bernina means it's stitch regulated and it stops when I stop moving. There's no coast going on. Betsy, what do you do if the tension gauge doesn't run smoothly or the tension is not to your liking? Well, occasionally, I, if the tension numbers are too high or low, I will actually adjust those before I put the bobbin in. It doesn't happen super often. Um, if it's running unevenly, the first thing I do is, is pull off a couple of yards, like see if that last little bit of winding the bobbin is where the unevenness lay and see if I can get it to run smoothly. Every so often I've had an entire bobbin that's just is run amok and there's, there's no fixing that. You will get bad stitching results. Um, but usually it just involves spooling three or four or five yards off the bobbin and then it runs well. Pauses while Mr. Producer catches up. Dawn, do you adhere to the suggestion that there be four inches of excess backing fabric on each side of the top? That is certainly my preference, Dawn. But I also like to please my clients. You know, often they have just the right fabric and there's really not quite enough and can we get by with it? And so in practice, I often work with less. But I do prefer to have that four inches of extra backing. It's a lot easier. Roberta, how big are your loops for this design? And I'm very envious. You just always seem to know your quilting path. That's a hard one for me. How big are my loops? They're longer than an inch. I would say the loops are an inch and a quarter, like the inner loop. And then, of course, the echo is a little bigger ish some larger some smaller and Roberta if I know where I'm going it's mostly because I've done this design on probably 20 to 25 quilts so you get pretty comfortable with it I often recommend to my students when learning a new design to don't just do it on one quilt but do it on two or three or four quilts in quick succession because it does get into your brain and makes it so much easier and then even if you don't do it for a year it'll come back to you it's like riding that bicycle Betsy, on what do the yard rulers sit? Oh, they're sitting on my rail at the front and on my dead bar at the back because those are fairly level with each other. I don't see a picture. I see me straight on. There we go. You want to see it? So there's the dead bar at the back, and here's my rail at the front. That's what they sit on. And I move them because the, the, the further in they are, the more they lift that clamp. So I adjust that depending on how much lift that clamp requires to get out of the way of my sew head. That's good coffee, even coolish. Um, I'm not seeing the question, Dave. Mr. Producer is falling down on the job. Claudia, what do you do if the selvage is a bit wonky and not perfectly straight as it appears on the backing you're working with? So do you mean on that front edge? Oh gosh, that's a kind of involved question, Claudia. I know what you mean. If, if the selvage is too tight, I will actually make little snips in it so that it lays flat. If the selvage looks loose and roughly, I'll be conscious of that and be easing it in a little bit. And I just judge that by how it looks by getting it to lay flat on the bar as I'm lining it up. Terry, does a service person come to your home? They probably could, but in this case they did not. We took the sew head off the rails and took it into the service shop. For, for Bernina's at least, it's relatively simple for them. Most of the service shops will have like a workbench that they can literally fasten the sew head to. So they're not moving it around on the rails, they're just working on the sew head and that's how he worked on mine. Terry, this is probably just my novice showing, but I tend to find myself underneath the quilt and on the floor ripping stitches out. You're giving me hope I might not have to do this forever. No, you, you shouldn't have to do it forever, Terry. And this gives me a great idea. I should do a little YouTube episode on ways I've found to check for tension before you've quilted a whole pass, right? But certainly one of them is checking your bobbin tension and knowing where that's at. Another one is knowing what to look for on the top surface of your quilt so you don't have to climb underneath it. So I'll try and give more information on that, but it's more than I can conclude in a minute today. 
Okay, Tracy, are you using a ballpoint needle? And what size needle are you using? Let me just look at it so I make sure I give you the right information, Elizabeth. <clears throat> I have got a 9014, and it is just a universal needle. It is not a ballpoint or a top stitch or anything fancy. It's just a universal needle by Schmetz. Um, it is my understanding, and I'm not 100% sure on this, but Bernina packages needles as as pros. They come in a red package, and I believe they are manufactured by Schmetz too. And so I've been using those pros quite a lot. That was another recommendation I got was to stick with those needles. They have a coating. Um, but today I have just a Schmetz Universal 9014 needle on. So that's all I know about needles. It's not a lot. Okay, you guys, let's keep quilting. Here's the process. I have advanced my quilt. We're going to have the big view, yeah? I have advanced my quilt so that I can see my quilting edge up here. I know that none of it is extending, you know, further than I'm able to quilt. And you'll remember this end of my quilt is just a little bit bigger than this end of my quilt. So this is something I need to watch for with every pass. And there aren't very many passes. I do that by literally looking along my rail, right? And looking along my seam allowances, is that straight? And if it's not, I tug it or zhuzh it until it is. That is critical that you do that with every pass so that you don't have an ugly surprise when you get to the bottom end. So I've done that here. Another thing that I always do is pinch the batting as well and give it a tug. Batting for me tends to want to pull up in the middle, especially on a quilt that has multiple passes. And I end up with batting that's kind of going like this. And it's really hard to deal with a batting wrinkle. So every time I advance, I'm always pulling my batting down too. If that doesn't feel like enough to you, lift up your floating top and make sure that it's all smooth under there, that there's no weirdness going on. Pull your top back down. Watch that seam line again. Right? So now we're going to go and baste both ends and get back to quilting. And there are only three passes on this little quilt. So once again, I have the quarter inch basting stitch on right now. I do not have my channel locks on. I laid the quilt straight by eye, and that's what I'm going with. I'm putting more tension on at the back than I am at the front. This is just a, an easy way of pulling that back edge, keeping it feeding under the needle. And as before, I'm going to go ahead and anchor that stitch at the end. I don't want that basting to come out or for it to shift at all. Put my side clamp on while I'm over here. So, like I said, I have yardsticks that belong to my grandpa. It's kind of nostalgic to have them in my quilting studio. Anything long and straight will work. I know quilters who use the types of curtain rods, you know, where one rod fits in the other and they have kind of an L-shaped end. Those are a great choice because they stay in place. <coughs> Excuse me. Where's my bobbin thread? I have so many threads here. There it is. So there is another way, by the way. You're seeing a close-up. I forget what this is called. I always forget to do it. But you can also hang on to your uh, top thread and literally scoop underneath the foot and grab that bobbin thread. It works really well, too. It works especially well if you're trying to keep your needle in one place and not move it at all. It's a great way to scoop it out from under there. Yesterday I was doing a digital design and I used that scooping method. <coughs> okay, you guys, there's a cough coming on. Dave, do you wanna mute a second for me?
So now I've got a cough drop in my mouth. I will try and not rattle my teeth on it too much. So my goal once again <clears throat> in creating this square quilt is to hold the quilt in place while I'm quilting. Quilting this curvy line, and it is a fairly dense quilting design, will tend to pull up the quilt if you don't have it secured and held in place. So it's really important. Have these side clamps on, have that side basting done. I personally prefer to baste before I clamp. I feel like if I clamp first, I've got more tension on the backing than on the top. So I like to get things smooth and in place, then baste, then clamp the whole thing. My magnets on the front and we are good to go. Now, I make it a practice with my edge to edge quilting of alternating directions of passes. So my first pass I began in the top right hand corner. This one I'm going to begin in the left. And I'll tell you why. The tendency, you know, when you're moving this direction with your quilting, you can't really see me with Lucy there, but when I'm moving from right to left, the tendency of my loops is going to be there's more of them going in that one direction. So if I alternate on the next pass, it makes my quilt as a whole look more pleasing. You don't get all the, all the loops running in the same direction and we don't want that. Again, using my echoing technique to get all the way to the top end. Excuse me.
we were talking earlier about the size of the loops. <clears throat> and certainly one could do larger loops and get around the quilt faster, absolutely. To me, this size seems to fit the scale of this quilt. It is both a small quilt and it has fairly small piecing in it. A lot of these half square triangles and little squares, for example, are one inch. So I feel like to do even two inch loops, you know, would be a very large scale for that and wouldn't look appropriate. So I try to think of those things as I'm both choosing the des which design I'm going to use and choosing the size of the design that I'm going to quilt, the scale at which I'll quilt it. I definitely have quilted these loops larger on other things. They don't have to be this fine. Notice as I'm quilting that I am not, I am not avoiding the thick seam allowances. I am in fact aiming for them and trying to stitch over them or as close to them as I can, wherever there's thick intersections where star points come together, where seams cross each other. Quilting those down firmly is the best way to make them lay nice and flat in the finished quilt. Sometimes you have to slow down a little to go over them. You certainly don't want to break a needle speeding over them. And this little strawberry, for example, there's a ton of seams in there. <clears throat> so quilting them down firmly and keeping the small scale of loops all helps to make this quilt look beautifully flat when it's finished.
You'll notice I never did go back to the manual stitching. I decided to play it safe. And there certainly are advantages to using the regulated stitch mode. It is a tool and you absolutely should use it when it's helpful. And if you're working on a design that's new to you or a little unfamiliar and you are finding that you need those pauses to decide where to go next, that's a great time to keep your stitch regulator on. When you are really comfortable quilting a design, that's a great time to take it off and instead focus maybe on the smoothness or rhythmic quality of your quilting. <clears throat> but the truth is we can only focus on one thing at a time. So whichever is the thing you're working on, that's the one to focus on today. My current focus is on not breaking thread. <laughs> and it seems to be working. Within the next day or two, I'll post <clears throat> some photographs of this quilt and get some good lighting on it that really shows up the quilting so that you can see and judge for yourself whether you like this look of laying a texture over top what is a fairly busy quilt. Certainly my thinking was that this pretty evenly spaced texture was a great complement to all that's going on in the quilt without overshadowing it. So we're nearing the end of our second pass. Another good opportunity <clears throat> to be typing in questions if you have them. I would absolutely love if you would hit like and subscribe if you like what you're seeing. Find this process of seam quilting in real time to be helpful. That would be great. And if you would even share this channel with your quilting friends that you think would be interested, I would really appreciate that. If you are interested in learning more of these designs in detail, you know, I've said it a few times, today's quilting is very much um, the big picture view 
looking at the whole quilt, thinking of, you know, the loading, the choices, etc. But I do offer some online, on-demand um, classes that teach these in depth. One I've mentioned already, which is my freehand quilting master class. And another is, <clears throat> excuse me, a monthly membership that is called Advance. And in that membership, it is ongoing and new content is added to it each month. So you have access to all the content, all the time, and it is a low monthly fee. And that, once again, is called Advance. If you follow me on social media, I'm Stitched by Susan everywhere, and there's been some information about the Advance membership in the last few days. So if you wanted to read about that, there's definitely links there um, to go to some informational pages, frequently asked questions, that sort of thing. All right, we are getting ready to advance for the last time. I'm just going to get this rolled up and then we will take some questions. I thought I could get it all in one pass, but I might have to do a pass and a stitch. Okay, let's have some questions. Karen, I'm a six month long armor. I usually leave the ruler base attached. Would it be helpful to remove it when I try a project with mostly all three hand stitching? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, do you want the front camera, Dave? Karen, that's entirely up to you. The only really downside of leaving that ruler base on is it usually conflicts a little bit with how far forward your machine can come. And so it limits a little bit your quilting space. It doesn't hurt anything. It won't make your free motion quilting easier, I don't think, to have it off. It'll just, um, give you a little bit more throat space to work in. Heidi, why do you use the yardsticks or curtain rods at all? I'll show you when I put the clamps on the ends, Heidi. I'll come back to that and, and show you why I use them, why they're helpful. Christina, I have a Bernina 24 as well. How do you make the anchor stitch happen? Is a button programmed? It is a programmable button, so check out your manual. It's very easy to program them, so you can both decide what the button is going to do, and in the case of a lock stitch, you can decide how many stitches you want it to have. I have mine set at five. So with one push of a button, I get one, two, three, four, five stitches. Very handy. Not necessary, but handy. Carol, I made a quilt using the Brightly Pattern and Riley Blake B plaids. Seeing this episode, I know now how I want to quilt it. Yay! Thanks, Susan, and you're welcome. Alicia, what mode is your machine running? Manual continuous precision. Not sure of the terminology. The needle stops when you stop moving the machine. How many stitches per inch? Lots of questions. I have it set for 10 stitches per inch right now. It's kind of my perennial favorite. And I am on, in the Bernina, we have BSR 1 and 2, which are similar. They are regulated stitching. And the Bernina 2, it stops stitching when I stop moving the machine. That's what I've got it set on today. Betsy, do you find the red laser dots distracting? Are you actually using them or are they part of the actual lighting system that to us appear red? They're not part of the lighting system. They are the little cameras underneath that are gauging the movement of the fabric. That's the stitch regulator. Those little cameras are watching the movement of the fabric. So in order to have stitch regulation on, those lights are on. If I were to stitch in manual mode, and it's one of the reasons I like doing that on camera, then they go away because nothing, no cameras are watching the fabric. Rebecca, thread color, please. It is an eggshell. I secured the thread number is 0101. That may not help you much, but it's just ever so slightly off-white. Betsy, are those texture pictures only posted on Facebook or do you put them on your website? And if so, where on the site? Oh, great question, Betsy. I currently have on the homepage of my website, there's a gallery of pictures that go by but it is not regularly updated. So pictures of my current things end up on Facebook and Instagram, yes. Uh, there's usually at least one, I will say this. I usually take one and put it, um, I, I make a thumbnail for the YouTube episode. So that's one place you can find one picture, but it's very small. <laughs> Lauren, what's the status of the ruler you use? Need one. Great question, Lauren. I have found some great rulers and I hope to be bringing you a YouTube episode about those rulers shortly. They're put out by Jamie Wallen and we've kind of got a little um, conversation going about how I can make those available and maybe even offer a discount to you guys. So 
Um, you, you, I'm not going to go get it because I'd have to go to camera, but the yellow ruler that I use and recommend for so long that's not being produced anymore, I believe I have found a replacement. But I'll let you know more of that as I get to know more about it. Joan, really just a compliment, expression of gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Producer, again for helping make these LNU possible, LNU being live and unscripted. Thanks to Susan for sharing her wisdom. Love this music. Thanks, Joan. We appreciate you too. Joan's been a long time, <coughs> excuse me, long time viewer and friend. More questions? That's it. Okay. So here's the deal, you guys. I find that I actually am not going to be able to quilt quite all of what's left on, um, you know, within my throat space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll it up just a little bit further so that I can base that whole bottom edge and get it in place. And then I'll back it up a little bit and do that quilting. So let's see, I need to roll it about two more inches. Yeah, maybe three. So now we're looking at kind of the other end of the process. We talked at the beginning of loading the quilt about this little bit of fullness that happened here because there's a lot of seam allowances with this um, sashing and little cornerstones at this end. Do we want the bigger picture, hun? So I'm going to kind of reverse the process that I did at the beginning, which was to distribute that a little bit and drop some pins in place for kind of anchor points. So here's my trusty pins, also a magnetic dish, by the way, love that thing. So I'm checking this visually in a couple ways. Number one is my edge fairly straight across this bottom based on my the bar of my quilting machine. Yes, it is. Number two. Are my sashing lines running fairly straight this way? That helps me to decide whether I need to shift left or right, right? So I'm just kind of evening them all out. That will give the, the best possible look when the whole thing is done. And I'm just gonna pin at each of these cornerstones because they're a handy little marking place, aren't they? I do not know that you can see this on camera. Maybe you can. This one right here, it's sagging just a little right here. Not a big deal. But I don't want to cut that off because it will be so noticeable in that tiny little one inch blue square. So I'm actually going to zhuzh my fabric up there <clears throat> and try to make a straight and even basting line across the bottom and just quilt that fullness in. It's like magic. Nobody will know. We quilters get to perform all kinds of magic on the projects we work on. And it's so very rewarding. Again, you're seeing me pulling this in a bit with my fingernails against the seam allowances. There's just a little bit of curvature going on on this edge too. I can visibly see it. So I'm just controlling that by pulling it in toward the center. Part of that will get evened out like after I've basted this line and then I put a little tension on. Can you see how that evens out a little bit? That's part of what will help it. The process of using my left hand while I'm quilting will help it. All those things will work together to just get that fullness in there beautifully and unnoticeably. Okay, I think our pins are adequate. When I am having to take a little care with my basting, oh great, I didn't cut my threads. Silly me. Um, when I'm having to take a little care with my basting, I do like to start on the left side because then my left hand is free to manage the fabric while my right hand is pulling the machine. There's no right or wrong way. You don't have to base left to right or right to left, or even from center to the edge. There's just whatever way works for you to achieve a good result. So we're back to our four stitches per inch basting. Hang on, I'm gonna pull that long thread out of there before I sew it in. <clears throat> I 
And here is where I like to have my left hand free to be managing the fabric. And I like to pull the machine with my right hand. So that is my only reason for sewing in this direction. If you were left-handed, you might want to reverse that. And again, if you're not comfortable with your fingers this close to a sharp needle, this is where you might drop in more pins. All the pins do is serve as an anchor and I've got one at each cornerstone, so I, I'm not gonna move those pins till I get to them. Each one anchors by the time I get to this cornerstone, I've got to have pulled in whatever fullness comes before it. It just keeps me on the straight and narrow. And I'm going back and forth between pulling it under the needle and holding it in place while the needle stitches it. Either way works. Either way, I'm just encouraging that fabric to get under the needle and not to push out in front of the hopper foot. And yes, I am being a rebel and I'm sewing over pins. At this speed and at this large a stitch, it seems to me to be an acceptable risk. You do you but I have not ever broken a needle or a pin so far. Now you'll see I do have a tiny little pleat there that got caught in a stitch. I'm able to go back and just by pulling on that fabric with my nail, smooth that out. So there's definitely still easing going on, but I'm not going to quilt an actual pleat into there. It'll be okay. This may seem painfully slow, and it is, but it's faster to do this slowly and carefully and with forethought than it is to redo it or have to deal with a pleat when you've created one, in my opinion. So to me, this is well worth it. Mr. Producer, am I hitting cables on that side? I'm getting resistance. Bear with us a second, I'm, I can feel the resistance and I've just caught some of the camera cables. Phew, free and clear. You don't want to pull too hard or the whole thing will come crashing down. No, just kidding. Dave's got it pretty secure. So here I'm using, because I have free space at the front of my, um, the nose of my long arm, I'm using my thumb to push down a little bit on that, and that is pulling this fabric under the needle. So all of these depend on which direction I'm going, how big a seam allowance I've got to work with. They're all acceptable ways to get that fabric under the needle at the pace it needs to go. Now I'm using my fingernail to pull. Can you see that? There was a little more there than my thumb could pull under. <clears throat> all right, so let's get all the pins out of the way and then we'll look at those side clamps. Which side is easier to see, Dave? Does it matter? Probably this side. Okay. Let's do this side. So I'm putting my side clamp on to begin with. And strapping the tension on it. And here comes my yardstick. <clears throat> I'm gonna bring Stella over so you can really see this. What I want to do is lift this clamp up a little bit. If I don't, when I move Stella over here, ah, there it is, do you see that clip? When it grabs and catches, I don't want that to happen when I'm quilting, I will get some square loops. 
So putting my yardstick under just lifts this clamp a little bit and I can adjust how much the lift is by how close in I put the yardstick. The closer in I pull it, the more lift I get. And I just go until I have enough lift that I can scroll Stella out there and it doesn't catch. It just slides right under. That's what the yardsticks or any straight device would be for on the edges. <clears throat> It just pleases me to have my grandpa's yardsticks on here. And yes, they do fall off sometimes just because of the vibration of things and because they don't have any hooks, but it's worth it to me. Okay, now that we put all those clamps on, <laughs> oh my goodness sakes. Now that we put those clamps on, remember I've got to rewind just a little bit. Off they come. This is what happens when you're talking. So I do have the whole bottom edge of my quilt basted, which is really nice because now I know everything is all squared away and in place. But I have to rewind just a little bit to be able to reach <clears throat> all the area that I need to quilt. They go on much faster when I'm talking when I'm not talking, don't they? I just get down to it. Little side trick. I've got a seam allowance here that's having difficulty fitting into my channel. So the tip of a pin will just help coax that in there. Okay, we're all set. Now, last pass we began at the left side, so this pass we're beginning at the right side. We don't want that. Here again, I've got thick seam allowances on these little pinwheels, and I am purposely quilting over them to cause them to lay down flat.
think we should place our bets early <clears throat> as to when the bobbin is going to run out. Funny story, yesterday I was quilting a fairly large quilt and um, it was a digital design, right? So I've got it all loaded up on the computer and, and I was kind of quilting it in rows. So every time I did a row, I would check the bobbin and say, now do I think this is gonna last all the way to the end of this row? One particular row, I thought, oh gosh, it's a very near thing. Anyway, I decided to bite the bullet and, and let it go and see if it would get to the end. And it did. So then I, you know, swiveled back to the other end of the quilt and went to put a new bobbin in. I kid you not, three inches of thread left. That was my bobbin chicken win yesterday. Today, I am pretty confident we will not get all the way to the end of this quilt on this bobbin. Eventually, it's going to run out. But when it does, I've got a new one already. I'm just thinking a minute. I keep going way further and I want to get back this way. See, I don't always know where I'm going either. I sometimes have to think through my design. This is the direction I'm moving. This is the direction the echo is going to go. How do I get back to where I want to be? Again, no shame in pausing, regrouping. As your GPS would say, recalculating. There's some areas here that the camera is really, really vibrating. I'm not sure what's causing that. So I keep going back and forth between quilting with one hand, which is what I really want to do to manage the fullness, and hanging on to the handlebar, which helps the camera stay a little more stable. Once again, if you are enjoying this, if you're finding this helpful, I would love if you would give it a thumbs up and a subscribe to the channel and even click on the bell so that you get notifications whenever I do upload a new episode or go live.
If you're interested in supporting this channel, the easiest way to do that is by heading to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitch by Susan. I'm sure Mr. Producer will put that in the chat window for you. Um, there you can make contributions as small as $5, basically the price of one coffee. Or if you wish, you can commit to um, donating something each month. Every dollar that comes in that way, we spend on upgrading and bettering our equipment quality. So we're currently in consultation with a gentleman that attends our church, and he is a professor. I don't know his full term, but he works his full title. He works at a university locally, and um, videography is his thing. So we're in consultation with him about lighting. This is such a challenge for us because of working with a 12-foot machine. So it's altogether different than lighting, you know, a studio that's got someone sitting at a desk and talking, for example. So this is the challenge. Anyway, so I was talking about supporting me via buymeacoffee.com and about the fact that every dollar that comes in through that does go toward these sorts of things like increasing our lighting, our visibility, and our camera quality. So we are learning as we go. So many of you say how much you enjoy and appreciate these episodes, but I tell you what, I enjoy them too. It is just a treat to be able to come on air and chat with other quilters. So many of you are A, very understanding when I'm having difficulties, and B, very generous with your problem-solving tips and your experience. So it's a win-win, isn't it? This block has some great examples of thick, bulky intersections of seam allowances. So I'm just going to take it easy and I'm going to stitch them all down. You might have noticed that I'm not quilting all the way as close to me as I could on the front rail. And I'm kind of doing that on purpose. I know that I've only got a few inches when I advance the quilt, but it's difficult to fit in a freehand design in a very slim channel of space. So I feel like it'll be easier to make that look sort of seamless if I allow myself a few more inches. So I'm just getting this top edge of this quilted and then I'll go ahead and advance it one more time, that last little bit, and we'll be able to put right to the bottom at that point. Oh, caught those big thread tails again. Hang on a sec. They're under my side clamp, so I can't just pull them out. There we go. Get that out of the way. <clears throat>
pretty sure we can advance enough now. Okay, all set. Get those shirt sleeves rolled up. Um, let's see, what do we have for questions? And maybe Stella's kind of in the way though, Dave. Right? Do you do this way? There we go. Okay, we're going to take a couple questions because then I can perhaps talk about them while I'm doing this last little pass. Marilyn, wouldn't it be helpful to use the channel lock when basting the sides and bottom? Yes, it would, Marilyn. It just, it involves running back and forth from side to side of my machine or having my um, computer on so that I've got some control there of those channel locks. So it's not the easiest thing in the world to do on camera, but yes, in practice, it would be much easier to use those channel locks to get straight edges. You're right. Carol, would a rubber band around the ends stop them from jiggling off? What were we talking? Oh, we were talking about the, the yardsticks. And yes, you're probably right. That That's not a bad idea. Nancy, how do you deal with the excess fullness pushing to the basting on the side? I Usually, it's just with that whole idea of my left hand or little weights. And I just try and distribute it further into the quilt so it doesn't all run out to the edge. I'm pulling it in as I go so that when I get to the edge, there's not any more there. <clears throat> Linda, I have trouble visualizing my FMQ stitch design while moving across to create a smooth design. Is there a lighting tip or suggestion? So hard if white on white or even busy fabrics. Linda, I've posted a few times about this. You might, if you're, if you're on social media, you might go back and catch some of my reels. There was one fairly recently. But when I have something that is really difficult to see on that even black light won't help me see on, my solution is to turn off all the lights in the room, overhead lights, machine lights, everything off, and stand one lamp off to the side. And basically you end up quilting by shadow. It casts a very strong side light and therefore shadow, so your indented quilting shows up. That's my solution for the very hardest designs to see. Savannah, is there a way to use PayPal for the cup of coffee? Ah, uh, Mr. Producer's thinking about that. He says he'll post it in the chat window. Okay, so watch for that. Jan, Susan, I did not notice if you oiled the machine during the time you quilted this little beauty. I did not, Jan, but I did do it before I came on air. I used my brush to clean everything out, and I did my drop of oil before I came on air. I try and do it at least once every day that I'm quilting, often much oftener. Yeah. Gail, this is my first unscripted, and I'm so impressed. Thank you. I've already learned so much. Fantastic, Gail. You know, I try to have this balance between over-talking, which is me, and long show, which is what you get. But I want to pack it all in, right? Karen, I've been away for a few weeks, but last time I watched, you were having multiple thread break problems. What was solu the solution that you found? So I've talked about that a couple times already in this show, Karen, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let that go. I did have a major servicing done, and that brought to light some things. Jan, Susan, have you ever been told you have beautiful articulation of words? Oh, that's very nice, Jan. I don't know that I've been told exactly that, but I appreciate it. Okay, let's get quilting, you guys. And we are dealing, as I mentioned early on in the episode, I'm working on a quilt where the, the piecing had looks like slightly smaller seam allowances, and so it's just a little bit bigger on one end of the quilt than the other end of the quilt. So this is the bigger, looser end. So it's not very much but there's this little bit of fullness, right? That I'm trying to get pulled in. And so I'm gonna try and do that with manipulating with my left hand. And I think I think it's better if you have this view, Mr. Producer, because the camera really does wobble when I don't hold the handlebar. We've got it, you can see the camera here, right? We've got it kind of extended on a long arm and it's really long arm, ha ha ha. And it's really picking up all the vibration unless I'm hanging on to the handlebar. 
But on the bigger view, you don't see that. It's only on the close-up view. So I am now literally using my left hand to almost stretch the quilt top, but gently over the nose of the long arm. And that just helps the fabric to get eased under the needle. It just helps. And if you're not comfortable quilting with one hand, then putting some small weights on both sides of the nose of the long arm will help as well. I actually do keep a set of vegetable cans. I never eat canned vegetables, so I keep them for quilting. I keep a set of a pair of cans in my quilting studio, and I use those when I absolutely need both hands on the wheel, so to speak. And I will just drop a can on either side, and it just it just helps. I'm going to echo my way back because I want to I want to fill in this little corner over here. I don't want to have to come back here later on. So did you see how all that fullness was just eaten up near to the basting line with that little process of easing the fabric under the needle and also the fact that I have this loopy, loopy design. I don't want to um, gloss over that because that design, that um, the quality of loopiness and curves did factor in my design choice. Anything that is very curvy really helps to pull in any slight bit of unevenness and I've said it repeatedly this quilt is is there's not a lot of it it's about three quarters of an inch difference from one end to the other and there's the bobbin end but that three quarters of an inch it's very possible to just ease in absolutely seamlessly no one will ever be the wiser and just just by knowing fabric and knowing the difficulty beforehand and managing it as you go that's the only thing now here's the problem, you guys. I haven't had a corner in a long time. So, where am I going to make my splice? Well, I've got to undo at least a couple of inches. Can you see what I'm doing? Oh yeah, you can. I've got to undo at least a couple of inches to get back to where I had even bobbin tension. So beyond that, since I don't have a corner to go to, I'm gonna go to an area where I was crossing a seam allowance because those seam allowances also help in anchoring threads. So I'm gonna to go to this corner right here and here's the seam allowance. So it's right in that area that I'm gonna do the thread anchoring. The multiple layers of fabric um, hold it more securely and they almost give it a place to disappear into. So no one will ever find that little anchor spot. Okay, let's get in there and get that fresh bobbin. Now, if I was not on air, I probably would take my side clamp off here and open up my machine and oil. Just so you know, that would be good practice right now. But I feel like we're already getting fairly long, so I'm just going to move right along and do that after the show. But I am checking my tension smooth as anything, smooth as butter. Great. My drop seam ripper tells me right where I need to be so I can find it. So I'm overlapping mm, probably two or three stitches for my previous stitching line because it, remember it does not have any locks at the end of it. I was just undoing. So all of this is happening right in the layers of that seam allowance. So it's going to be beautifully hidden. And I go ahead and quilt a little bit before I quilt the tails or before I cut the tails, sorry. Once or twice I've had them, if I trim them first, I've had them actually pull right out when I sort of start stitching with a jerk. So I just like to wait until I've quilted a couple inches. 
and then I don't have to worry about that. Okay. Let's get organized here, see where we gotta go next. make a point of this here. <clears throat> you can see this in the big picture. There's a bit of fullness pushing up against my basting line right in here and I can see that. So again I don't want to push it toward the basting line or I'm gonna end up with the pleat and I don't want that. And if you remember when I was basting there was that little tiny bit of curvature here right? So that's what I'm dealing with. So as I'm quilting you're gonna see my hand on this side of the needle. I'm actually encouraging fabric to go under that needle. I don't know that you'll see that encouragement on camera, but that's what I'm actually doing to get it to go under the needle before I get to this basted edge. Gotta decide which way I'm going here. So that's why you see my thumb and, and first finger almost going up on both sides of the needle because I literally am pressing fabric up there to encourage it to get under the needle. When I need to travel, I just scooch along that basting line. And here we are down at the basting line and it's all going in smoothly. Success! It's often really tricky to fit in a design when you get near to the edge of the quilt. You know, you're not really getting a nice number of repeats and things like that. I don't, I don't worry too much about it, other than with this particular design, I'm trying to get the loops not all running in the same direction. So if I notice I've made, you know, two or three sets of loops 
all going horizontally, then I try to get something in there that goes vertically, if you know what I mean. So they don't look like they're all the same on that edge. They don't look like I've stuffed them all in, although in reality I kind of have. So we're approaching our last corner, last chance to ask questions um, about the loading process, which we talked a lot about today, about the design choice process. Um, last chance to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more of these episodes. We do try and do this live streaming about twice a month. It is just subject to life. so. Do our best. But best way is to subscribe to the channel so that you know, click the bell, and also on my website, sign up for my newsletter. I do endeavor to send out an email at least a day in advance, two or three if I know where I'm at, and uh, post a photograph of the project that I'll be working on, as well as um, kind of the topics that I'll be talking about a little bit. So. Um, if you do want to sign up for my newsletter and you aren't already, easiest way is just go to my website. You'll get a little pop-up screen that invites you. I think it offers you a freebie in exchange for your email address, so that, that gets you on my newsletter. Again, just traveling every so often along that um, basted edge. down to tight corners here. It is coming together. One little loop in the corner and we are finished. We'll go ahead and pull up my bobbin thread and trim the tails and move Stella a little bit. Okay, Mr. Producer has set up. Okay, hang on a second. Will I be seeing the picture? Okay, he's got a roving camera set up, but I'm on pause, babe. Okay. Oh, he says, don't touch anything. He's going to get, oh, look at, look at, look at, look at this, you guys. Now let's see how steady of a hand I have. So I'm just walking along with my phone. Whoa, there we go. Susan has to learn how to use a roving camera. There's the little chicken, isn't it cute? You're getting an idea of the texture. 
especially for those of you who aren't on social media, I will post some pictures, but if you're not there, this is your look at the texture. These are very small blocks, by the way. So that whole star block is a six inch block. So it looks very magnified on your screen, but it's a pretty fine texture. I'm gonna back up just a little more and let you kind of get a look at it. There we go. So Mr. Producer says the next batch of Buy Me A Coffee Money is going to go for a gimbal for stabilization of the, of the uh, close-up camera. Okay, are we done with, we done with this one? Whew, wow, that was a process, you guys. Me and a camera. Anyway, we do aim to keep getting better and better, and we're always learning, right? Always learning. So, any last questions before we go? Lots of questions. Let's have them. I'm totally out of coffee, so I can't do that anymore. Now, how large are the blocks in the quilt? Six inches finished. Yep. Dolly, what happened to your sock on your thread? Eh, I forgot to put it on today. That's what happened. It happens. Nancy, do you use denser quilting to ease in the fullness? Density does help with that. Curves is my top tip for choosing quilting to help with easing in the fullness. Yep. Terry, regarding a rescued hand-sewn Dresden vintage needing to be finished and loved, is using merino wool plus a layer of flannel too much fullness or texture? I do not think that's too much fullness. I'm, I have not ever used flannel as a batting, so I don't know its properties. But I have certainly done like a Hobbs 8020 plus a wool, and that has worked well. Uh, Dawn, other than oiling, what other maintenance procedures do you do? Certainly cleaning. Certainly cleaning. You know, I've got a bristly brush. I've got a vacuum. I've got, um, you know, a, a microfiber cloth that I wipe the rails and the wheels with, those sorts of things. So simple but essential cleaning, basically of lint. Yeah. Scarlet, first time catching you live. Nice. Love the tip about restarting in a seam allowance after replacing the bobbin. It's a helpful way if you're at all worried about those ends being secure. The seam allowance just adds that little bit to it. Liz, do you have to make yourself blink? No. In fact, Liz, I try to blink less because when I don't think about it, I blink, 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 blink on camera. And so I'm always kind of conscious of it and trying to blink less. <laughs> okay, two-part question coming up. Betsy, are all the loops facing downward or slightly turned to the side? Okay. And except for this bottom edge. I, my, my effort, Betsy, was to make them go in all different directions. Just by nature of moving across the quilt, when I'm going left, they tend to head left. But I try and curve them and make them be in different directions so that hopefully when you see the whole quilt, you don't see a pattern of which direction they lean in. Okay, last question apparently. Uh, Dolly, how did you name your machines Lucy and Stella? Uh, great question. I don't know if I have a great answer. My first machine I actually named Lucinda, and that lasted about two weeks, and it didn't feel right, and that's when I settled on Lucy. When the new one came, I knew I wanted to name her, and it, I, just, I just thought about it. I like a short, succinct name. I knew I'd be saying it on camera a lot, right? And so I, Stella just kind of grew on me, and, and just, it just felt right. Much like, naming, much like naming your kid, right? You just try out all the names and suddenly one fits. Oh, Mr. Producer has changed his mind. A few more questions. MS, what is the name of the Lori Holt quilt pattern, please? Sorry if I missed it. So it isn't a specific pattern. All the blocks are from the Lori Holt book, um, Farm Girl Vintage. And I know I did put a link in that. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I think Facebook too, um, in, the, in the description, Sometimes you'll have to click on see more to see more of it, but there's a link in there to that book. And so that book has a bunch of different blocks. And so this is just a sampler of all the different blocks that Joanne chose to make. And quite a few of them actually repeat in this quilt, but there's, there's just a huge selection in Lori's book. All charming. Diane, I made the big mistake of handling two magnets at the same time and got my fingertip caught between them. I had to get hubby to help me get my finger out. Ouch. Yes. These magnets, well, of course I don't have one on here now, they are strong and, and I've had to learn to work with them too. Early on I actually put uh, like drawer pull type handles on them. They have pre-drilled screw holes so you can. I found those to just get in the way and be awkward so now I've gotten used to sliding my finger under them but they absolutely are strong and they absolutely are a toe stubber. So 
yeah, you got you got to get familiar with them, but they're wonderful, wonderful tools. Okay, is that it? That's it for questions. All right, you guys, thanks for joining me. And in case you're just tuning in now, this has been a live and unscripted episode where in real time, I have done an edge to edge quilting design on an entire quilt. So there was heavy emphasis on the loading process and some of the decisions that I made and the basting and even the design choice. And then I've gone all the way through quilting the whole thing, talk, talk, talking all the way through as I do. So thanks so much for joining me. We will plan to do another one yet in June, although I do not know yet what date. Best way is to go to my website and sign up for my newsletter and you'll receive notification and or like and subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and YouTube, and, uh, probably or Facebook too, but for sure YouTube will let you know whenever I have a new episode up or whenever a new live is coming. So that's the best way to know for sure. So once again, I'm Susan Smith. You're in my studio, Stitched by Susan. Thank you so very much for joining me today. Until next time, happy quilting. Mm -hmm.